Well, hey, hey, welcome to another Toolbox Tech Talk. Yeah, it's Sunday. Time to get the groove on. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone, to another Toolbox Tech Talk. Uh, it's getting to be such a regular thing here in lockdown land. Uh, Melbourne, the capital of keep us all indoors for a year if possible. But uh, it's it's made for fun and I've had some great guests on this show and uh, yeah, it's been really enjoyable talking to them. So before I introduce today's guest, I'd just like to give my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land that I'm broadcasting from, which is the Wurundjeri people here in the Yarra Valley. But actually I'm a Kiwi and I'm from <laughs> New Zealand. So I just gotta acknowledge what the traditional owners of where I come from, uh, which is the, the iwi of Whanganui Atara. So that's Wellington, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, uh, yeah, so today my guest is Dave Petrie. He's the National Business Development Manager of ID Electrical in New Zealand. So g'day, Dave. Hey, Glenn. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, no worries. No worries. How are you going over there? We're, uh, we're enjoying a, a, another lockdown ourselves. So uh, <laughs> we feel, uh, feel kind of bonded. <laughs> kind of bonded to you guys at the moment. And... Uh, <laughs> tolerating tolerating this rough time for everybody it's uh it's gonna be a long journey you get to see a lot of the inside of your house right yeah far too much um yeah the, the kitchen is a seems to be the almost like a holiday destination now <laughs> <laughs> and we, we uh it seems fitting on the uh the fourth birthday of this organization that we're wearing the uh the 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 uh, identi identical merch. Yep, there it is. There, I got the yep. merch. <laughs> I hadn't actually realised that. Is it today the day, the fourth birthday? Yes, apparently. Oh, well, how how auspicious to have you yep. on for the fourth birthday event! Woo! -hoo! Yeah, big deal, eh? Well done, <laughs> Jack and Costa. <laughs> Well, uh, if, if for those who don't know uh, anything about solar cutters, Dave, do you want to kind of give your uh, elevator pitch? Uh, a like-minded group of people that uh, try and support the industry with uh, as much humour as possible. <laughs> yeah, it's a great support group. I mean, it really started off as a Facebook group, and uh, it grew from there. When you you know, in the days when we had conferences, the 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 the, the solar cutters event was one of the main events. <laughs> Drinks in the evening, or yeah, they they were great. Yeah, I think it's great what they've done for the industry and. You know, trying to raise the, raise the, uh, not just the profile, but the expectations of the of the workmanship, and the camaraderie that goes on between everybody, and the support that people give. Like it doesn't matter whether we're all, you know, in a lot of ways we're all competitors against each other in this small industry, and we're all, we are all trying to help each other. And I think it's a great, a great community. Yeah, I mean, as you know, I've been involved in training. But in a way, what solar cutters are doing through their Facebook group is actually providing real-time advice. Sometimes it's a little bit random, like someone asks a question, they get 10 different answers, but it kind of filters through to a bit of a consensus. And so it's a really great self-help group um, and, and people sharing their grief about, you know, product dramas. I love the fact that most people found out about the DC isolator issue here in Australia uh, through Facebook, <laughs> not yeah. through the regulators who should have told us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's you know, proving that the industry, you know, this group does its, does the right thing by everybody. Um, um, and I think it was a good, it was a good balance to the, uh, to the crap solar, which Chris and I had been running for, you know, six, seven years prior to that as well. You know, that's, uh, there needed to be a quality um, angle instead of everybody just slagging off it, seeing how much crap was out there. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's really the flip side of crap solar. Uh, you know, what do you do not to be crap? You know, you, you, you go quality. So it's that's yeah. what it's all about. Hey, just thinking about this DC isolator issue, I, um, I, I presume you know what I'm talking about. Um, has it had an impact on New Zealand? No. Um, because, well, certainly not from the rooftop, it, certainly not from the rooftop, rooftop angle because we don't have them on the roofs here. Um, we're allowed to just use an MC4 as a disconnect. Um, and most inverters now have a approved isolator built in. There's still a few that don't, um, but the majority do. So the selling and installation of 
external third party DC isolators is a very low, uh, low ranked issue here at all. Right. So just for those who are not, I just realised I didn't, I shouldn't, I should have introduced the problem for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, and if you happen to be in the industry, selling or installing DC isolators in Australia, you should really pick up your ears at this point because uh, what happened on the 29th September, just you know, a week ago, was that uh, almost uh, the majority, something like 80% or so, of all the DC isolators sold in Australia were no longer allowed to be sold because of a, a bit of a hiccup with the certification process. So uh, that kind of meant they got pulled very suddenly without any industry consultation or, or planning. Uh, and so that also affected quite a few inverters with internal isolators uh, that were also tested by the same test lab. So, yeah, um, they have to go and get retested and recertified, and that could take weeks, if not months. So we're going to have a bit of a hiccup in Australia. And uh, even though um, New Zealand's part of the same regulator group, the ERAC, uh, it, they have a different um, regulatory environment, so it may not affect you in the same way it has here. Yeah. For, so for us, that would be probably I think determined by WorkSafe at the moment but it's yeah I, I we all really don't know how that's going to filter down to the real world mm. I mean the advice from the regulators has been uh, in Australia there is no safety issue we're not talking about a safety issue here we're talking about a compliance with a certification process so the certificates just didn't have that right look about them something was missing from them um, uh, one of the tests or something I can't remember what it was and uh, therefore it wasn't valid so there you go. That's the uh, the latest drama in the uh, solar coaster industry, <laughs> as Nigel yeah, Morris likes to call it. <laughs> it's, it's almost like if we if we don't have a problem, we've got to, somebody has to dream one up. Um, yeah. <laughs> just, just when you think just when you think the industry is tracking along quite nicely, there'll be you know an issue like this pops up, and it it, it seems to happen just without fail every year. There's some glitch either over supply or you know the latest dramas around pricing and and supply of product. Um, yeah, it's just another headache going into, I guess, the traditionally busiest time of the year, and especially this year. Um, for both countries, it's going to be pretty rough because there's been so much lockdown and there's so much uh, built up demand. Um, and then your STC is dropping you know, again 1st of January, and you've typically got that huge high demand going into Christmas. Um, yeah, no, we don't. We just <laughs> we don't need more problems right now. Hey, um, before I start with uh, asking you about your solar journey, I've got a little apology to make to you, Dave. It's about 10 years late. Um, <laughs> you're probably wondering what it is. I left you standing on stage at a conference once when we were supposed to be doing a little duo act. I think we called it something like ACDC, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap or something like that. Uh, and yeah, you were the DC I... guy and I was the AC guy and I forgot to turn up <laughs> and you rang me from the podium. <laughs> Funnily enough, I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> where, where the hell are you? Yeah. Can you? yeah, can you get here right now? That would be great. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's the word you said. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. And I looked out the uh, – I was up in the green room and I could look down onto the stage mm. and I saw you down there and went, oh, oh that's me. I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> Yeah, good times. Oh, conferences, don't you miss them? I, I really do. I really do. And, you know, I know there's been some virtual conferences run online, but there's just nothing like getting in front of people and touching and feeling product and seeing exactly how it is because, you know, I'm a I'm a bit of a, a tech head at heart. Um, so, yeah, I, I, like to, I, I like to see this stuff and talk to people about, you know, what it is and their, their roadmap in to the market you know all these things that we we need to know about what we're going to be selling next year and that's always the 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 hard thing to, to try and do a bit of crystal ball gazing all the time and you know conferences are a is for me an integral part of that yeah so, yeah I mean, we've we got all energy coming up here uh, coming in Australia and it's now going to be a virtual event, which is going to be kind of curious. Um, I have have had some positive experiences in a virtual conference. So the Smart Energy Conference, uh, before they ran their actual one last year, the one before that back in 2020, they did a, a sort of virtual online one. And there's one thing about it I actually found quite good. It was kind of speed date um, uh, 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 in a room. So you basically went into um, a theme 
and you'd had three minutes and people would just pop up and you had, could talk to them for three minutes. And so it was similar to walking down an aisle at a conference and bumping into people and going, oh, hi, uh, what do you do? Oh, yeah, 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 and here's my business card and you sort of exchange a few details and move on again. So that, that actually kind of worked. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be open-minded, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just nothing like the real deal. And now two years in a row, it's, uh, and, and having – having not missed that event, for, I don't know, 15 years or something, you know, since when it was called ATRA. And it was, you know, we do little conferences in Cairns or Alice Springs or whatever, um, you know, and then it, it just grew to be too big a beast. So it had to be held in one one venue, one location. So yeah, it's, it sort of really took off at, when was that? About 2010 or somewhere around there. It's called growing up. <laughs> yeah. The industry's yeah. growing up. It's yeah. not a bunch of sort of old dudes hanging around chatting about something. Well, <laughs> used to used to call us, used to refer to them as, as the grey hairs, and you yeah, know, all, all the all the grey hairs and beard strokers would be over in one corner talking about yeah, yeah. And now now here we are. Yeah, in my day, in my day, we yeah. didn't do it that way. That's right. <laughs> Fair enough. Hey, Dave, um, so look, you've been in the industry for, I didn't even ask you how long. How long have you been doing solar for? Uh, it's probably a bit over 20 years now. Um, I, I started training as an electrician in Eildon on houseboats and my first solar installation would have been a, probably a 20-watt panel and it was worth more than my week's wages as an apprentice. Um and was absolutely terrified of breaking it. Um, and that would have been 89, 90, somewhere around there. Wow. So, oh, that is yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> so then, then I went on to train in, uh, in radio communications. So I ended up doing, um, doing a lot of uh, comms work um, and kind of fell into, you know, as you do with working on radio sites and antennas and mountaintops and solar panels and batteries and, Ended up, yeah, and then found myself working for a fairly new at the time startup business called M and H Power, and that was uh, that was in ninety oh, seven or ninety eight, I think. And then in two thousand three, we started the solar division of that company because we were selling a lot of solar batteries at the time, and understood that well, if we're selling solar batteries, there must be solar panels as well in somewhere in this in our customer network. So we, we introduced SunTech to the market um, in 2003 and Outback. So that was a that was a big shift in our business, not from not just from doing batteries, but became a, a supplier of all those components. Um, and I think it might have been in 04. It wasn't long after that we started selling SMA, which was, I think we were the first company to sell SMA in Australia um, because at the time all the SMA product coming in was green and badged BP. Yeah. <laughs> so you had some of the red ones. Yeah, well, we could order whatever colour lid we wanted, actually. Um, so, yeah, we ordered red. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was how the SMA ordering system worked. You could choose your, <laughs> choose your own adventure with a lot of the options at the time. I remember Conogy with their grey ones. So, yeah, there was a fair bit of OEM going on there. Yep. Yeah. And that... Yeah, at the time that lid either had a, you know, it either had just the lid or it was just it was the lid with LCD. So your combinations of product that were available to order were quite large because you had every product was double that again because you had to offer the right lid to go with it. So yeah, inventory control was a real nightmare in those early days. I still remember that lid because uh, one of my students went to install one at TAFE and or took the lid off and just pulled it. Of course, it then broke the earth lid lug off. off off the lid, and it's, well, it's spot welded there's, on. There's no, there's no shame. Uh, we've all done it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they had this problem too. If you didn't, you know, well, it's. It's not unique to SMA at all, but if you didn't tighten up those screws enough, water would just go around the rubber seal. So there's like a little drain at the top there and water would often collect and leak through. So, yeah, the one at TAFE, I remember someone said, is there supposed to be a water mark inside it? And you could see up at the screen there was like water. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it took about two, two years to fill up, but there you go. Shows you how often we inspected <laughs> systems there. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, um, so, gee, they've grown like you have uh, <laughs> since those days. Um, so what happens after MNH? Uh, I... Or well, MPOW, went, sorry. Yeah, Yeah. well, it, it was a name change you know, a couple of years ago after that, and I believe recently mm. they've been sold, so there's, it's all quite a... It's quite a different company now to what I ever knew it. Um, I went and worked for a battery company for a couple of years. I went and worked for R&J Batteries, um, and we secured the Full River brand distribution for Australia, and just as I left, they were starting to sell the BAE product, and that was... Yeah, I figured what year that was anyway. That was so yeah, my 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 background is strongly in batteries. Um, strongly in DC too. I think you follow the, the, the sort of heritage of Australia, which was it all started with um, off grid communication sites, because uh, that's where solar really made a uh, cost benefit. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So, um, Empower and then what? Well, and then uh, RJ um, batteries. Uh, I, I really enjoyed my time with those guys, but mm -hmm. it's I um, I had an opportunity to to work in a in a business partnership in designing and designing and selling battery chargers, and we picked up the distribution for Midnight Solar at that same time. So Midnight Solar, are a, an offshoot of Outback, and built uh, for the time exceptionally good maximum power point trackers um, up to 120 volt battery battery voltage which not there was i think there was only one other company maybe at the time might have been arl building the, the similar product I don't think they did the 120 um i can't think someone who did 120 volt batteries back then but yeah MPPT. But there, that was that was that was a that was a great couple of years in uh in that business and it, oh, it was again, iMark. Built, iMark had a 120. Yeah, they yep. they came out with a product around the same time. Um, except I think we just had a bit of a jump on the market, a bit of a bit of pedigree in in the the manufacturer and the guys behind it um, were, were recognised and known in the industry. So, so, so a, the um, Midnight Solar people were formerly with Outback, and they decided to do their own thing. Is that how it worked? Yeah, Outback, very similar story to how they got born out of Trace. You know, the, yeah. the tra <laughs> tra Trace was taken over by Xantrex, and so the story goes, they didn't particularly like working with their new overlords, so they all split and started Outback, and then a similar thing happened in Outback. Then they got, I, I think it was... I think it was around the same time they got taken over by Alpha, and the same sort of thing happened again, and they split, and started, started out back. So yeah, yeah it's happened a few more times since a... then too. <laughs> so it's they really get yeah, to I know. And then there was around. another side shoot there that was Magnum inverters, and then there was yeah, yep. there's yeah, there's quite a few uh, the very closely related people and families involved in in that business in that mm. power conversion electronics in the US. Yeah. But I remember myself, I, I was installing Outback MPPTs and then when I saw the Midnight Solar, it kind of looked so weird. I was thinking, is this is this kind of like a toy? It kind of looks more like a, a 1920s kind of entrance way or something. Yeah. It was styled well, in a very it was, curious way. It was always a very polarizing product and even, uh, and that and that just comes out of the guys that have designed it. You know, the, the, uh, the Outback, the original FM, FM60, which became the F, uh, FX60. FM80. FM80, yeah. yeah. That, that product was modelled after a, a dashboard grill. You know, they, they kind of ah. like the, the retro look. And then I think the, the, the Midnight product was um, started from pencil sketch of a, of a Wurlitzer jukebox. So the, yeah, know, they, that's what it is. It just looks like a Wurlitzer jukebox. Now you, yeah, I understand. Yeah, they, they <laughs> like that. They like that retro kind of look, but shove it full of. The latest goodies in, inside, you know? yeah. And like and like Robin said, who designed the product, you know, he could have made a black box or a white box or whatever. It would have been as boring as hell, you know. And he just wanted to add a bit of his his flair to the to the design of it. Mm, indeed. Hey, so l let's um, go forward from there. So, uh, what happened after RJ Batteries? We started DC Solutions. Yep. So DC Solutions um, 
we did fuses, housings, circuit breakers, and predominantly it was the midnight solar products. But we were also designing a lot of uh, battery chargers, mostly for the caravan industry at the time. So we were um, designing product from scratch um, and had one of the first 30 amp chargers, 12 volt 30 amp chargers that didn't have a fan on the market, which was a pretty big deal at the time. And we had a really good factory, really good partner building those for us in China. So it was, uh, that product filled the hole for, there was a lot of, there was a lot of junk out there at the time and a lot of noisy junk because they all had fans. And yep. you, you're usually trying to sleep in a caravan when the batteries are trying to charge overnight. So usually... Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. So it was, it was for the RV caravan market. Yeah, and you'd have a caravan and pull up at a caravan under park. Under the seat of your, a, your lounge, yeah. or your bed even, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we really hoped they wouldn't be under a bed. Um, <laughs> but yeah, typically they'd be in the, in the toolbox in the front. But even the small fan running flat out will produce a little bit of vibration and noise and after dc solutions i guess it was a uh you could call it a bit of a midlife crisis i didn't quite know what to do with myself next um had a had a really good mate of mine in new zealand ring me one day and have a bit of a chat and i was sort of saying to him i've a bit of a loose end i wasn't sure what to do with myself next he said oh come over here there's some work over here for you guys for a while and um yeah so i came over here for what i thought was maybe a, a one or two year adventure um met met my now lovely wife sue and uh yeah she told me i better stick around and uh, here we are it's uh seven years later i think it is now so you're part of the reversing the migration trend from new zealand to australia it's now australia back to new zealand yeah yeah, it's it's always a surprise when, and you know, there's the Aussies. The Aussies been slowly beaten out of me, and you know, I say things to my friends and family, and I speak a certain way now, and they they seem to find that very amusing. What do you call those things you put on your feet in summertime? <laughs> They're still a thong. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't go a jandal. <laughs> uh, can't go a jandal. <laughs> <laughs> it's far less confronting for people from other countries because thong has multiple meanings too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is kind of the, kind of part of the amusement too. So, how have you found the move to New Zealand and the solar industry there? I mean, you've so embedded in the Australian solar industry, and it's a big change. It it's it's a it's taken it's taken quite a while for me to adjust because after seeing the rise and rise of the Australian industry and, and, and being part of that and to I, when I came over here I thought oh it's about to explode here it's all it's all the same all the same drivers all the same same motivators are here ready to go it's the same same products um, but the the lack of rebates here and the lack of feed-in tariffs um, has meant that the growth is much much slower and I've had to learn to pump my brakes and just realize that we're not going to explode in the industry here overnight but the thing is the the nice thing is though the market certainly is growing and right now it's growing at a reasonably quick rate and that is i think it's the best form of growth because it is organic um, and it's not artificially fueled although the the comparison always comes up all the time about oh you know what about australia and what about feed-in tariffs and what about what about this and why can't, why can't we have that I don't think the gov I don't think the government here are particularly uh, in the in the mood to introduce any of those things because they can see the industry growing, and that and the industry here has certainly voiced their opinion against this sort of thing because we do want stability. We don't want the solar coaster, right? Um, and, yeah, you know, so it's a, it's a more real industry. Like it, the incentives are it, it it produces renewable energy and it saves you some money. It's not about chasing a rebate. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the, you know, I don't know, what's 
what's a typical value of STCs on a 6.6 kilowatt system? Like average value. Look, I've lost touch. <laughs> it hardly has changed because um, as the multipliers dropped, the price of solar panels have dropped, and so it's had you know no big impact. I mean, every every uh, first of January or leading up to it, there's all these ads saying rebates are ending soon in Australia. Actually, the multipliers going one more down as it will go to 20, 30 to nothing. And solar panel prices have followed the same trend. So, yeah, the pricing really hasn't changed a lot. Hey, before I move on, um, so we've got uh, an audience out there watching, and I should just remind people, you're welcome to ask questions, comments, uh, give us a like, thumbs up, all those good things. And look, I've got a fellow Dishy mate out there. Now, if you don't know what Dishy is, <laughs> it's uh, Michael. He's actually uh, in my neighbourhood of the world, and uh, we're both coming by a Starlink dish on the roof, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> It, the, the colloquial, if you haven't heard it, is called Dishy. Um, people refer to it as. So, um, hi there, Michael, and uh, g'day. Uh, so, we've also got a few more there, uh, VK and uh, such developments. G'day. It's good to have you with us. So, can I also take this opportunity while I'm speaking to everyone, um, just doing this series, talking to people from the solar industry, learning about their stories, their businesses, their loves and hates, and a bit about their own, you know, non-professional life. Uh, anyone else you'd like me to interview? So have a little think about that, throw it into the comments and chats, because I've really covered all the states and territories in Australia, and now I'm over in New Zealand, but I've just told Dave he's not representing New Zealand. I'll certainly interview a few more people from <laughs> my home country. Um, so <laughs> don't, don't feel like you're put on the spot there, Dave. Anyway, uh, so we were just talking about the New Zealand industry and how different it is from um, the Australian industry because we had, you know, these feed-in tariffs and rebates drove our growth. But uh, the New Zealand market is what? What's the sort of capacity like in New Zealand for solar? So right now, I think it's just under 2% of connections have solar. That's So, uh, yeah, there's 98% potential market uh, here. For, for connections and you know the larger the 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 uptake now is certainly accelerating in the commercial space uh, the residential space you know there's still a lot of uh i don't even I'll go so far as to say it's almost resentment against what they've had in australia with uh, the generous stcs and feeding tariffs but you know as as we all know you know the the uh, stcs are falling and equipment costs are coming down and one of the things that's changed here a lot probably in the last five years is the speed of installations because guys are getting better at it i think it's becoming more of a you know more of a, a job where some companies that's all they do now is solar installations so they start to get really good at it you know a couple of years ago it, it wouldn't be unusual for somebody to do a solar installation they might do a couple of year so, you, so that you never get slick at it, whereas, you know, you don't, you didn't have, you didn't have crews of guys that just that's all they did. They became really, really good at it. Um, but that's changing. That's there are companies now here that are doing that, and so that's been one of the biggest changes. I, I think, probably for the residential market, is that speed of installation. Um, the other. The other thing that's a little bit misunderstood is the what they call the low user rates here, which are on the way out. That's been flagged as something that'll happen. I think it's over the next five years. They'll phase it out 20% per year over the next five years. But that's been worth, for some people, around 500 bucks a year benefit to them to go on the low user rate. You better explain to the Aussies what this low user rate's all about. So if your consumption for a property is under 8,000 kilowatt hours per year, which I don't know, that worked out to about 23 kilowatt hours a day. Yep. Um, if, you, if you're under that, then the line's connection fee um, is only a $10 a month, I think it is. Whereas once you're over that, uh, it's a bit of open season and they can charge, I don't know, up to two, I've seen people paying up to $3 a day. Um, wow. $3, $3 a, a day for connection. $2 a day is fairly, you know, up around there can be fairly, fairly normal, you know, eighty somewhere around there. Yep. Um, so that, that could quite easily be for a lot of people that get solar. And that, you know, the, the whole point of low user rates was never to benefit the solar industry. It was, it was meant to benefit 
true low users and give them a a bit of shelter from from uh, from line line charges. But of course, once you connect solely, your demand drops off, and you, in most cases, would qualify for low user rates. Ah, because it's net metered. So um, you're low user from a net metering perspective, but not actually low user of energy because a lot of it's yeah. coming from solar. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. So mm. I don't know, 500 bucks a year benefit would right. be unusual. And you know, over 10 years, that's a $5,000 benefit to you, um, which I actually think is better than STCs. But obviously, it's not upfront. Yeah, yeah. And it does but, encourage um, systems that will last the distance too. I mean, it's always been one of the problems with uh, the Australian model is it encourages, incentivizes the cheapest system um, with no lifetime kind of guarantees because even if it fails, you still got that cheap price. Uh, it doesn't have to keep can, working to save you money. Can, you can do it again. Rip yep. it down, throw another one up. <laughs> throw another one up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit sad. Um, and, the, and the environment here, like it's, you don't get those, like certainly not like northern Queensland, where you don't get those severe heat and severe humidity, which really accelerate the failure of components as well. Um, so, I think there, I think in time there will be um, a lot of systems fail here that maybe were installed ten years ago, but we're not seeing. You don't see that rapid drop off like you do in some parts of Australia, where the gear has to be absolutely spot on a little bit more forgiving okay so the the residential market is kind of slow but steady the commercial market in new zealand is starting to pick up why is yeah. that? that that one of the probably one of the biggest breakthroughs recently is finance um because that's there's now there's now a couple of companies op offering decent decent finance uh, packages so that, that takes that upfront capex cost away so that's, I think that's probably been one of the biggest changes in that market. Plus, you know, it's it's a it's a no brainer if you're going to generate power in the daytime while your while your business is running. It's uh, it's it's such a good fit. Yeah, for most most daytime businesses, it's the perfect model, which is uh, you generate when you're at work, stop generating when you go home. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. What about batteries? Are they making a inroads into New Zealand? <laughs> Surprisingly, more than you'd think. Um, I've, I, I'm always, I'm always pleasantly surprised when we see what we've sold. Um, but it, it, it still surprises me at the same time that there is that much uptake. Um, a lot of a lot of people, and you know, including myself, will try and tell people that batteries aren't the best investment you can possibly make. Um, but you know, neither are new cars and a lot of other things so you know you can't stop people from having nice things um and in some places like uh, in particularly around christchurch where they've got long long memories of uh power outages for extended periods of time um the battery does give power security as well um and there are a lot of places towards you know end of line and places like that that do have a lot of outages and you know just to give have that power security of being able to run your internet and lighting and refrigerator or so on um that's you can't you can't really put a price on that i always say you can't put a price on cold beer you know if if that fridge is still running that's that's money well spent you can put a price on a business losing power though <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. so the, and that's probably you know one been one of those big shifts in australia too with a lot of battery installations you know that, that uh, has taken place of a lot of the traditional UPS market. Mm. So, so relating a bit to batteries, so in Australia we've just uh, moved to the five-minute settlement on the 1st of October on the national electricity market, which really incentivizes battery storage as a way of, um, you know, uh, joining into that through aggregation, that, that market. Uh, is there anything similar in New Zealand? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Hmm. I hadn't heard. I just curious. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting how you know something initially may not seem like a great investment, other than it gives you some security, like backup. Suddenly becomes a winner when you've got a market incentive uh, for, um, you know, playing in the frequency and ancillary services market, which is where where the batteries are going to be playing in that five minute settlement. Yeah. 
Hey, we've got a question here. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer it. Feel free if you can't answer it. But uh, this is from Wilfred. He says, can you name those finance companies, please, and mention what scale of installation they might consider? Uh, okay, so off the top of my head uh, would be Energy Ease. And I, I don't think they have a l limit, but I'm not, I'm not a finance guy. That's it's, a, it's a, sorry. That's about as much as I can tell you. That 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 relationship between those companies is with the the retail or you know, the installation company doing that work. You know, that's sort of that is one step removed from us. You know, we are a wholesaler. Um, we supply we supply the equipment only. We don't get involved with that um, that that relationship. Yeah, I should remind people that uh, you work for Ideal Electrical, so um, you're basically a supplier of equipment as opposed to an installer or a finance company. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, yeah. So we we we've we wholesale that equipment. We're part of we're part of the Rexel group globally. Um, they trade as Rexel in most of Australia. I think they trade as Ideal in Queensland as well. But yeah, we just supply equipment. We don't get involved with that. Uh, with the finance side. Cool. Hey, let's just take a bit of a turn towards um, equipment since you mentioned it. Uh, like in Australia, there's certain brands which you'll see, say, in the Grid Connect market turn up over and over again. I mean, uh, in the cutters world, Fronius is very, very popular. Um, what's the situation in New Zealand? Uh, very similar. Um, you know, we are lucky that we do share the standards and we do share a lot of that product knowledge and availability. Um, that's that certainly is one of the benefits for little old New Zealand is that we do get to uh, we don't have to go and reinvent the wheel we can just look at what's been successful in Australia or you know what hasn't been successful and and basically just copy what they've done um, you know, we're, we're we're a distributor for SMA and SunGrow um, you know if you look at the the I think one of our one of our competitors has aligned themselves with Goodwe and you know the it's the same, you know, and Fronius is an exceptionally good product and represented here by Tazpak very, very well. Um, so, yeah, the products are here, they're available, they're very well supported. So um, there's no there's no shortage of good gear. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> there's, no, there's no shortage of crap either. Um, you know. <laughs> Did, I remember the days in Australia when people, well, installers often would just buy a shipping container full of panels and get them delivered to their warehouse and off they went. They had no idea about the company, the quality. They just thought they were generic products, but we've moved on from that time. Yeah, well, I, I know one company in Australia that ordered one container load of panels and that was great. And they ordered another container load of panels and that was great. And then they ordered another load of container load of panels and they just never turned up. <laughs> they, the, whoever had sold them had taken their money and vanished. You know, <laughs> you know, they'd, they'd, burnt, they'd burnt however much money that was. But yeah, that's, it's, yeah. it's thankfully less and less of that going on. And I think, I think the Australian market learnt probably 10 years ago um, that when things go wrong, you actually do need somebody to pin it back onto. So, yeah, for, for us, for us as a wholesaler of equipment, that is a that's a big responsibility for us. We we have to have a lot of due diligence around the products that we sell, and um, I'd quite happily say that we're not the cheapest um, in our business, but we do intend to, and we do need to be here in you know the next ten to twenty years because that's the that's the service life expectation that this this gear has and that we need to stand by yeah yeah i mean that is kind of in a way one of the problems with solar it can last a very long time and therefore people's expectations of that warranty are going to last right to the end of it so yeah yeah unfortunately people do remember so. <laughs> yeah there's this thing in australia called express warranties like if you say uh it's going to last 25 years but you don't actually put it in a warranty document you've just expressed the warranty and it's going to catch you up one day if, if that's in, if that's in print you really you you've just created your own warranty hey um change the topic uh well not quite um off grid in new zealand what's that like oh it's it's probably a bit it, it's it is a bit like a... oh Sorry. just dropped your microphone all right is that better yep um similar to australia it's it's everywhere it's you know, people that in 
people that do it uh, do it because they have to. Um, you know, there's obviously the extremities in, in each market where one end will be a professional installation done with professional or what I call industrial strength equipment. And then there's the other end of the market that seems to think they can do it with some truck batteries and number eight wire. Um, and then they replace it next year and the year after, forever after. So it's, but there's not, uh, again, because there's no STCs, there's no, there's no padding out of those prices. So, you know, the, those high end systems are typically a high end price. So, you know, we see a lot of, I guess you'd call it mid range, it's probably more mid range installations being done um, with, you know, the, the middle, I guess the middle tier product, not complete garbage, but, you know, not the, not the traditional, you know, it's electronic, Fronius, SMA, end of the scale, you know, you, there's less certainly less of that. Mm. Hey, so what I what I've noticed over my thirty years uh, is that you know off grid used to kind of go with the territory that you expected little. You expected a a system that probably was pretty basic. It might be a little bit DIY. Probably was a lot DIY. Secondhand batteries from Telstra, some fencing wire, a few panels out in the grass. But um, customers kind of put up with that because they actually liked the lifestyle. And they were probably of the ilk that um, they weren't expecting a uh, first world experience. But what's happened now is the price of, of off-grid systems in terms of the quality and their capabilities is up there with a, a, a normal grid connected home. So yeah, it's been a really big change. You're seeing you know, new builds in, in my area, which is you know, Yarra Valley, not even connecting to the grid because they know it's a similar price with no more bills going forward. Yep, yep. It's we do see some of that and we, we have probably a conversation once a week with somebody around exactly that scenario where they might've been quoted 50 to a hundred thousand dollars to get a connection into the property. So now they're looking at off grid as a, as a, as an option. Um, but you know, it, a couple of the things that I try and drill into these people is like, it, this is a lifestyle decision. This is not a, not necessarily a, a really good uh, economic decision, um, and you will have limitations. Like a lot of the a lot of people, a lot of the people that are in the mindset of going off grid are also in the same mindset or same ilk as the kind of person that's going to buy an EV in the not too distant future. You know, you're not going to go and slam a seven kilowatt load onto an off grid system without having some substantial um, gear to to run that, and that's going to jack the price up and you know and it's a little bit of a fallacy about being there isn't a there isn't an ongoing cost because there will be a generator um, that's going to need diesel it's going to need maintenance batteries don't last forever um, you know ten thousand dollar battery bank replaced every 10 years is a thousand dollars a year cost of ownership that's what's that 250 bucks a quarter that's that's about a power bill so you know, it's if it's done for the right reasons, absolutely, it's it can be a an out a, a fantastic outcome. But provided people are doing it with eyes wide open, um, yeah, we're happy, very happy to help them with that journey. Unless they sell the house just about in the nine year mark and move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've had to I've had to look at a couple of those jobs. <laughs> people people have moved in and hey, it's off grid. I don't have any power bills, and you know we just turned up last week and now it doesn't work because you know. They they plugged the, they they plugged three fan heaters in or something stupid. You know, it's <laughs> actually that's how I got into solar in 1991. I don't know if I told you the story. Um, me and my then partner bought um, a little getaway house. It was um, the drummer for Men at Work, the Australian band. It was his little holiday house in the Blue Mountains, and uh, it didn't have grid power. It was had a generator. <laughs> It was kind of during the heat of the market where you didn't really get a second chance to make a decision. You had to say, I'll buy it. That was it. And so we turn up and work out it's going to cost $250 a week in diesel to run this generator. <laughs> and, that, and that's what got me into solar. That'll do it. That's... Yep, that'll do it. Hey, um, so we've, we've covered a little bit about New Zealand in terms of the market and stuff, but uh, what about when you're not at work? What, what do you get up to when you're not at work, Dave? So I, when I when I came to when I came over here to New Zealand, I was I was flatting with a mate of mine 
for a year and he was a mad keen mountain biker and that, me having had motorbikes most of my life and done some pretty pretty epic trips in australia on motorbikes um you know i was looking i was looking to get another one over here and he's he's into mountain bikes and said i'll oh, come out for a ride it'll you know be great you'll like it and i really did start liking it we've got bought myself a bike and uh got more and more into it and you know, stupidly uh thought that it would be cheaper than a motorbike and <laughs> fairly quickly learned that it wasn't but yeah um, so yeah now and mountain biking in new zealand is a big deal um it it hasn't quite taken off in australia yet uh like it has here but it's a it's a really big deal here and there are some absolutely fantastic mountain bike parks and they've they've got fantastic trails and they're well maintained and you know there could be trails you can just cruise around the forest with mum and dad and the kids through to absolutely crazy downhill stuff with massive drops and huge jumps and yeah, it's there's a, there's something for everybody, and a lot of the parks now offer shuttle services where they can give you a lift up, up to the top of each run with the shuttle bus. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's that's been <laughs> that's been my source of amusement for the last couple of years is getting on getting onto the uh, getting onto the bike, and then uh, a year ago I had a ride of a e bike for the first time. Oh, I can bring that one picture up. Hang on, this this was this is pretty special. Here we go. So I, uh, after having ridden one a year ago, I was searching for something to buy, and I, having built a couple of race cars, um, I thought, well, I could just get a frame, and I could get a motor, and I could mount that in it, and I could, you know, I've been working with batteries long enough, I could figure out how to build the batteries and everything else, and then. In my in my searching for the right motor to weld into a frame, I found this company was had the motor that I wanted to use, which is a, it's called a Bafang Ultra motor. It goes by a couple of names. They call it a a G G510 or an M620 or there's a couple of different names this motor goes by. But it's it's a little bit heavier, but it's extremely powerful. And this company Frey um, were build these bikes with these motors built into them they were originally intended for i think like delivery vehicles and that um where it might be a three or four wheeler type arrangement that you know you're pedaling around doing deliveries in a city that's what it was in, originally intended for because it makes something like 160 newton meters of torque wow and just that's to put that, in, <laughs> put that in perspective there's most naturally aspirated four-cylinder cars would probably make about 160 newton metres of torque. <laughs> so you can tow your boat with it. The acceleration is, <laughs> uh, let's just say, addictive. <laughs> hey, before you go on, I want to just um, put something out to the audience. Is uh, There's something wrong with this picture. If you want to type it into uh, into the chat, we'll just see who gets it first. Um oh, you chocolate, chocolate fish. Uh, chocolate fish. You get a chocolate fish. That's right. From Dave will be sending it to you. So uh, yeah, they're pretty awesome in terms of uh, the capabilities. I always say an electric motor is an unfair advantage. You know, maximum torque at zero revs. Uh, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, but what about riding it off? You know, as a mountain bike. I mean, they're heavy, so it's got a um, you know, it's got it's, a battery and a motor. It is. Definitely heavier, absolutely. There's no getting around that. There's a bloody big motor and a, and a bloody big battery pack. Um, <laughs> We've got a winner, the, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's onto it. Um, yeah, so you do you do learn very quickly that the braking distance is the longer. You can't throw it around the same as a uh, <laughs> same as a, a carbon fiber bike. Uh, right, but, but what what that uh, what that the trade off the trade off is the just the, the acceleration and the power and the the sheer joy and the stupid grin that you get riding up hills. What what about jumps with that weight? How's that feel? It's it starts to behave way more like a motorbike. It's, uh -huh, it, uh -huh. uh, it wants to travel in one direction. You can't change direction on it very quickly at all. Um, 
So yes, you do need to give it a lot more respect. Um, because the other thing, it, it just builds speed so fast. Like you can go to, uh, you can go to 30 k's an hour just in a couple of pedal strokes. Wow. Hey, questions are starting to come in. I just realised I missed a couple. Uh, we'll just hold this picture for a second. Uh, Wilfred asked a little bit about uh, warranties. He's asking some manufacturers re require per panel testing for panel claims, uh, which costs more than a new panel. This is a real Pandora's box I don't want to talk about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, the... Um... I think this is a problem for the industry to, for all of us to, to wrap our head around exactly how we are going to deal with this long term. Um, doing doing flash testing of panels is usually cost prohibitive, even in just the freight to get them back to a central place. Um, I think my my opinion is there needs to be. Um, a very good relationship and some trust involved with the companies that are demanding this sort of thing. And I don't know the, the circumstances, you know, I've, I've heard of some, comp some, some people being asked to provide ridiculous amounts of evidence and testing and paperwork and so on. Um, it's, it's not an easy one to answer. At all. Yeah, and it I, does, I agree. It does depend. On, it does depend on. It does depend on the manufacturer, and and I believe the who sold it and the relationship with the person that they've sold it to. Yep. Um, I, look, just a, a positive story around that. I had some panels here, some Kyocera panels, back in for about fifteen years ago, I think they were installed, and a couple failed. And we contacted Kyocera, their rep in Australia, and they said we'll replace the whole lot. They didn't. They didn't replace the failed two. They replaced the whole lot. So they were acknowledging there was a batch problem and doing the right thing. And that was just yep. you know we didn't even have to prove anything. But I've also had companies who have wanted some IV testing, and they accepted my own IV testing. So I've got a, a, a single panel IV tester, and if the fill factor was below X, they'd just say yeah, that, that proves they failed. Yeah, I had I. Had about 10 years ago, I had a quite a positive experience with Sharp. And some people might say that I'm one of the few, but um, they acknowledged some panels right on the 10 year mark had dropped way down. I think they're about 50% capacity and they just said, yep, we'll replace the whole array. So and that was, I was, even I was surprised they did that because that was right at the time, right about the time I think they were pulling out of the industry. Um, so I don't know, maybe, Maybe they had some stock in the warehouse to find a home for or something. Well, maybe I just got lucky. But Sure. Hey, Wilfred also um, he just wants to know how to contact you. I don't know if you want to give any details, but uh, <laughs> there's oh, uh, a little... Connect with me on LinkedIn I'm, or, or on, uh, yeah, LinkedIn's usually the easiest. I'm uh, usually very <laughs> available. <laughs> So, so you're looking for Dave Petrie on LinkedIn, uh, the BDM for Ideal Electrical. So that should be pretty easy to find. Yeah. Don't have to do much of a search on me to find me. <laughs> so coming back to the, the, this mountain bike, look, you've, you've, you've kind of tweaked my interest here. I've been, you know, toying with the thought of getting one eventually. And I've kind of thought, when's the right time to delve into the EV, you know, the e-bike technology? Because the early ones were pretty clunky. Um, what's it like to ride, you know, in terms of exercise? Is it just like, you know, you do no work at all anymore? So this is one of the fallacies about e-bikes is, and, you know, even even downhill mountain biking is that, oh, you know, you're just rolling down a hill. Well, it, I defy anybody to come out for a ride and just say it's downhill because if down a hill you're standing up, you're pedalling, it's, it's quite a workout and... The joy, the sheer joy of having an e-bike is being able to ride up the hill without, you know, being completely knackered at the end of it. Um, and to give it, and the net result is with an e-bike, you just do more riding. So it's it's just you cover more ground, you see more, you see more, and it's just far more enjoyable. And I, I, at some parks that I would go to, that I would struggle to do maybe three or four runs by the time I've ridden back up to the top of the hill. 
on this thing, you could do seven or eight in the same day, in the same time frame. Um, and at the end of it, you'll be knackered. It's 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 certainly a lot more enjoyable going up the hill, but you know the the, the speed and the attention and the, the concentration that you have going downhill, and it's it's really good mentally too because you can't think of anything else if you're going down a hill fast. You, you don't have time to be stressed about the world or worried about what you're having for dinner or you know what you said to your coworker that day that was taken the wrong way. You know, you, you going is uh, like I said, the the acceleration as I said before, the acceleration is addictive and it's uh, it couldn't be a. <laughs> I I wish I'd done it sooner. Yeah, I, I think you've sold me on that idea, but um, they're, they're still not cheap, though. <laughs> that's, that's the other they factor. are, and I think a, a lot of the a lot of the tradi- and this is a struggle. I think a lot of the traditional bike manufacturers are going to come up against for the next few years is exactly how they position themselves in the market, because manufacturers like Frey and some others they just sell directly from their factories. You you don't buy them from a normal retailer. And yeah, okay, that's exposed me to a fair bit of risk. If something goes wrong, I'm dealing with parts from the factory out of China or I might be trying to diagnose electronic problems or CAN bus problems or whatever myself, which I consider myself capable of doing. And the average punter isn't. So, you know, there is a case for going and buying a bike from your local bike shop. And that's, you know, what I've done is certainly not for everybody. Are you so afraid to sell directly online? Yes. All right. Yes. Tesla you have model. To, you, yep. you have to import it yourself. Yes. Oh, yeah, cool. I just put the LinkedIn uh, but the, URL there for for those who are asking for Dave's contact. So. Yeah. yeah. But the ben- the benefit of buying that directly from that manufacturer is I've got a bike that I would consider superior to most bikes at somewhere around you know saving myself thirty percent. Which is wow. substantial. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of bikes on the market that wouldn't be half as good as what I've got. They'd be over ten thousand dollars. Which you know, you you got to you got to wonder why you wouldn't just go out and buy a motorbike at that sort of money. But <laughs> I can ride it in the forest. I can ride it to work. I can ride it on the footpath. I can ride it through the park, and nobody looks at me twice. Whereas I'm not going to do that on a on a motorbike. No. Yeah, I like what you point. It just means you can do more. So I've heard that said a lot. In fact, my own, my only experience of riding with someone with a um, an e-bike was me and a mate on just what we what do you call normal bikes? <laughs> non e-bikes. Well, we, um, we, 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 we call were, them we call them nat- naturally aspirated. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call them? Naturally aspirated. <laughs> well, me and my mate were naturally aspirated riding up to uh, there's a mountain at the back of us called Mount Donabuang, and uh, uh, you know we, we were pretty fit guys and we're going along well. And a friend who was um, in his sixties, uh, late sixties, actually joined us on his e bike, and he kept up with us. So it kind of meant that you know someone who, who's not as fit as someone else can still ride with the crew and enjoy that same experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that is going to be um, just a continual and rapid growth industry for op- opening up the uh, cycling to to lots a lot more older people too. Or, you know, I'm not going to call myself older just yet, but, you know, as, <laughs> you know, I I have fond, fond memories of throwing myself off a motorbike and breaking bones and all that sort of stuff and it doesn't really appeal to me in the same way anymore so you know this this is a this seems to be a really good middle ground <laughs> oh um michael just says his grandson's getting one for a second birthday wow it's kind of early to get on an e-bike but there you go <laughs> you gotta start him young start him young yeah yeah Hey, Dave, I just looked at the time. We're kind of getting to the top of the hour, um, so I might just wind things up here. But uh, really appreciate having you on on a Sunday and taking some time out of your day. I think, thanks for having me. I, I'm, uh, I was, I was uh, nervous as hell to start with. I, I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't have a voice for radio or a face for TV, but I seem to have pulled this off so far. 
<laughs> no, you've done really well. You've done well. And uh, look, I really enjoyed hearing about the, the, the mountain bike too. So, um, yeah, it's always nice to see what people's passions are outside of their, their, their uh, professional life too. Yeah. So I'm going to fare you well and send you off to the green room. Cheers, mate. And you're welcome to come and have a ride when, when you're eventually able to, to get out of COVID jail. <laughs> yeah, looking, we're all looking forward to getting out of COVID jail. Yep. <laughs> Okay, we'll see you, Dave. See you, mate. Bye. Cool. Well, um, thanks, everyone. That's just another show. And uh, look, as I usually do when I'm finishing up, I just like to let you know a few things about what I do, which is I do a lot of online content. So I provide a lot of training. A lot of it's for free. You can just go to my YouTube channel and watch the videos. I've been making a whole bunch recently on some new products here at the Smart Energy Lab. Um, so I'm doing some reveals of products. Um, occasionally I'll appear on Twitter, but not very much mostly. I don't even know if I use it, but, uh, uh, and post some, some sort of pictures on, on Instagram. So there's some ways uh, to follow me. But if you really want to go deep, I run courses as well. Um, lately I've been running battery standards crash courses. Now I haven't actually posted this one yet, but it's coming up in about six weeks time. So I'll have another battery course. So this is really more aimed at people who are industry professionals, whether designers, installers, who really want to get across the standards and understand the battery standard, which I keep calling the new battery standard, but it's actually two years old now, but it's still kind of relatively new and it's complicated. So if you're in that area, um, that's kind of a, a great place to go and enroll in one of those online courses. But otherwise, um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for turning up and I think it's time to, to play the outro. See ya. <laughs>